Hello there, and welcome to Automating New Mexico, uh, a workshop with Red Hat, Ansible, and One Technology. Uh, I'm Matt Brown, I'm one of the hosts uh, for today. I uh, also want to introduce uh, Dylan Hamamio, who is our New Mexico uh, rep. He supports, um, I think, every organization on this uh, on this on this event. So, Dylan, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, like Matt just said, my name is Dylan Jaramillo. I am local out of the Albuquerque area in New Mexico. So I'm happy to have everyone on board. And if there's any questions or you'd like to get in touch, please feel free to reach out to me. And we'll make sure everybody has Dylan's, uh, Dylan's contact information as well um, after this. So if there's anything you need, happy to help. Uh, with that said, uh, we're going to introduce David Marcus, who's going to be leading uh, the event here. Uh, David has uh, been with Red Hat for uh, a little over a year, um, but he's got a long history uh, with, with Red Hat's technology portfolio. Um, he came from a large uh, um, integrator, systems integrator, uh, supported the federal government. Um, David, with that said, uh, uh, the screen's all yours. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. I will pick up the screen share and... All right, let me know if you can see uh, Red Hat Ansible Automation Platform. Yep. Excellent. My name is David Marcus. I am a solutions architect with Red Hat. Like Matt said, I've been here just uh, about a year. Uh, I was a Red Hat customer for almost going on 10 years now. Um, and prior to coming to Red Hat, I was a uh, contractor specific to NASA, working several human space flight missions um, and, and other missions that are related to that field. So uh, needless to say, you do not have to be a rocket scientist to uh, do this workshop, um, but it does kind of make it fun in the sense that you can get the idea for uh, uh, how extensive you can utilize Ansible and, and make things work. So I was a heavy Ansible user um, along with several other technologies, but I can tell you with a team of uh, six to 10 that I'd had at any given point, I was managing multiple data centers, uh, thousands of physical virtual servers. Uh, we were just starting to breach into containers using it operationally. So um, we'll cover a lot of these topics today. It may have a pretty fast clip to it. So let me know if we need to slow down. Like Matt said, it should be an open forum. So uh, if a question just kind of peaks up as we're going through something, feel free to jump in. If we can handle it right then, we will. If we need to table it, we'll do that. Uh, but I'd rather have you ask the question than, than lose the question. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and get started. In the chat session, I did put a link to the workshop lab environment that I've created. So if you could all access that link, um, I'll talk through it here. And let me know if you don't have the link. Um, on here, this is kind of uh, just the one to all the resources we'll be going through today are all, all accessible here. Uh, one of the things we will be opening shortly will be the re, uh, REL exercises. Um, this will be what we're, we're walking through when we're not in slides. So it'll be a little bit of a blend with slides and uh, uh, hands-on, like Matt said. Um, the workshop deck, so pretty similar to what I'll be presenting today. There's just minor tweaks to it. Uh, but for the most part, the Ansible slides are here. Uh, my tweaks are more just kind of personal settings with driving these workshops. Uh, I will preface it is command line heavy, but please don't be intimidated by that. If command line isn't, uh, you know, something that you're familiar with, uh, we can walk you through it. I can get you set up. A lot of it's just copy and pasting stuff over and just kind of getting uh, a feel for how things execute. If you were to pop the hood of Ansible as well as, you know, drive the car, which will be the tower uh, exercises we'll be going through as well. So I think with that said, um, is anybody on uh, a Windows platform that's on the session today, like joining from a Windows laptop or desktop? Okay. Take silence as uh, no participants. If, if you are, we do have the putty for Windows. You're probably using that. Um, the uh, other pieces here, you really shouldn't need. I'm going to guess you have some terminal window. Uh, if you don't have a terminal window, again, let me know and we can work through how to get you uh, uh, operational. Um, so the first thing I'm going to ask everybody to do before we kick off the slides is uh, please click this link that says not sure what workbench you're assigned to. I did not assign anybody workbenches, but if you 
click that link, you should be able to enter your name and an email address. And I'm not tracking you, but this does allow one of the 50 workspaces that we provisioned today to be assigned to you. Um, so again, if you could just put your name in and, and your email address, any major credit card information, uh, social security, you know, be glad to get started. I mean, bye. Uh, David, that, that little joke would have got you let go from NASA. I know it would have. I know. <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> They're, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the folks that take uh, security very seriously. So. Extremely seriously. I mean, we weren't allowed to laugh at all for like the first couple of years we worked together. <laughs> <laughs> Only the contractors could laugh. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of basement, basement yes. work happening. Um, so what should happen is once you enter your name, uh, it should basically assign you uh, a workspace like one, two, three, four, five, six, um, something to that effect. So, and that, that's all I need you to do for that step. So if anybody has any issues, we'll just kind of take tackle it that way. If you're not able to get a workspace, please let me know. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started with slides. Uh, so what we're covering today, uh, again, it'll be a blend of slides with hands-on activity. Uh, it's really up to this audience. You know, it's a small enough group. Let me know how we want to go through this. If you want me to do some driving, if you want me to talk other points, uh, we'll, especially when we're on hands-on activity. Um, There'll be some overlap between the slides and the hands-on activity, and then there'll be some pieces that are a little bit disparate, but that's just because there's a lot of information here. Um, you can kind of get an idea for the agenda, nothing different than was in the meeting invitation. Uh, the pieces in uh, uh, the information that's in parentheses is really just letting us know kind of like essentially what exercises that those align to. We've already done the workspace assignment. So again, I shared out the URL. Hopefully we got some uh, lab environments, workspaces self-assigned. Once you did get that, um, if you don't have terminal on your uh, terminal on your system, you are able to launch VS code from the browser. Uh, I can do that live with anybody if you'd like, and uh, you're actually able to run the terminal through the browser that way. Um, if you do have a terminal on your, on your laptop or desktop, go ahead and uh, you can test SSHing in. You really just copy and paste the commands that are here username and password, um, tower we'll be using for later exercises like six and seven. And with that, we will get started. Um, so talking about Ansible, the main topic here, the main power behind this is obviously automation. Uh, I, a lot of times we do this, you kind of step back a little bit to understand like, why do we automate? Uh, in today's landscape, I think it's ever more important to do this because we're probably all experiencing an increased amount of work with the same resources that we have. And in all honesty, repeating manual tasks doesn't need to soak up more bandwidth than it already does. Um, more importantly, you know, I think greater automation pushes us a little bit further. I think it personally makes work fun again. Um, it's just how you think through problems that you're presented with. Um, how you tackle different pieces that come together as far as like how things integrate. Um, and with a, a tool or, or the right set of tools, you can do the very simple things to the very complex things. Um, so automation does have its, its greatest success when you start tackling the repetitive manual, like often the written procedures that reoccur. So this could be uh, something like patching that you do monthly. That's obviously one of the lower hanging fruit that a lot of teams tackle right out of the gate. Uh, provisioning assets, baselining operations. This was a lot of what I did with Ansible where uh, we had different teams from either the IT operations team to the flight software, ground software development teams. And everybody ended up using Ansible within inside of two years. Um, and each team was kind of assigned a layer. Our IT team would baseline a server from provisioning to operating, uh, operating system and just a little bit above. And the software teams would come in with their playbooks and their automation and lay down their variations of uh, software that uh, their teams would be using. So uh, personally, our, um, over the years that, that we were really heavy, heavily using it, we had cut our deployment provisioning from start to finish from, I think it was five days down to two hours. So uh, that sounds pretty extreme, but the more fluid you get with it, the more teams are talking using this, uh, this platform, uh, it really becomes quite efficient um, and it doesn't really take that long. 
Um, that being said, you know, automating consistently without error, you know, whether it's human error or whether it's machine error uh, is just an extra caveat, an extra nice piece to have on top of it. Um, and then once you handle that, being able to integrate vertically with other applications that you have or horizontally across other systems that you have uh, really becomes very powerful and, and a very interesting draw for the right tool. So a lot of times team members already or teams have team members that are already automating. This is something I found in my five years of contracting for NASA, five years of defense contracting. Um, everybody has different skill sets within our teams and those teams those team members often, uh, you know, are, are really smart enough to figure out ways that they can optimize what they're doing on a daily basis. Um, it's great to see that. At the same time, it does introduce from a, uh, a top-down view a decentralized or siloed automation architecture, uh, which does introduce its own set of problems. So for me, I think I would have a lot of my IT team using Ansible initially. I had a lot of my uh, uh, other IT team that weren't comfortable with Ansible doing bash scripting. Um, and then I'd have my developers, for example, just doing whatever that they knew best on how to make things run, you know, better, faster, stronger kind of thing. My network teams were often really using exactly this side slide is the, pro the proprietary software that comes with whatever tools or devices that they're managing. Um, obviously, those devices being firewalls, routers, switches. Um, oftentimes, those do come with tools because the operating systems are not what you find on the, you know, the average server endpoint. So. Uh, how you interface with those is obviously slightly different. Um, unfortunately, what that does for those team members that do know how to automate their task, uh, it's great in the sense that, they, that they're making things faster. However, it also means that they're likely not getting approved for PTO very often. We're overworking those folks um, and then being able to uh, automate across teams becomes very difficult, right? It becomes very single threaded, single sourced. And honestly, there just is better ways of doing it. Um, so our goal is with the open source community, make it easier for teams to automate and communicate those automations to one another, ultimately just solving more problems faster. Um, so why Ansible? Uh, this slide is pretty powerful. It actually says quite a bit, even though it looks rather simple. Uh, but obviously the first piece for Ansible is that it is simple. The automation is written in human readable language. Uh, it's very declarative, which is what you're seeing with a lot of IT systems, a lot of uh, uh, technology today, right? I want to declare the state that I want something to be in and I want it to stay that way. And I want it to automate how it makes, you know, stays on that within that threshold. Um, and then I also want it to be a tool that's usable by any, anyone, any role in the organization. I don't just want this to be a, a team that I have to stand up or certain team members that I have to uh, just allocate to be kind of the, uh, the key holders for this automation. I want it to be something that's powerful. So at any stage in the life cycle, uh, Ansible can be utilized from creation to configuration, uh, management through retirement. Um, that was probably always the most interesting thing, standing up systems on the, uh, um, even today, right, is uh, you really have to think about the full life cycle of it, and you want a tool that can handle the full life cycle as well, um, and jump in kind of at any point. Um, agentless, so this is really uh, Ansible's uh, claim to fame, in my opinion, in that you don't want to com complicate your environment, complicate your architecture, <clears throat> because you have to go and deploy agents across all your systems. Um, and in all honesty, just open up more complexity to managing things and uh, usually vulnerabilities that come with agents. You want something that is agentless that can use the way that you may connect to a system today to manage that system uh, efficiently. Um, so also something that works across any kind of platform. So whether it's lin uh, Linux, Windows, Unix, whether it's a network device, whether it's in the cloud, whether it's on-prem, um, I've used it everywhere that we've just mentioned on every kind of platform and what you're about to see is that uh, it works the same way, no matter what you're doing, what you're pointing it to, uh, what you want it to do. Uh, and then lastly, it does play well with others. I don't think I have that note on here, but uh, think about your current IT system. The last thing that I always wanted to do was bring a new system in, ramp it up by creating a bunch of content or filling it in with something that already existed. I wanted something that could tie in nicely. Uh, if you're kind of thinking like Legos, right? I just wanted to be able to attach and, uh, and not have to do a ton of configuration to get that attachment to work. So 
Uh, Ansible does play really well. Even a lot of times there's technologies that are out there that might look like competitors that we most likely have a partnership with because uh, we do have a very powerful, very robust partnership and ecosystem um, with a lot of players out there. What can you do using Ansible? <clears throat> um, I think a lot of times Ansible has the preconceived notion that it does configuration management. Uh, and that's right. It does configura configuration management very well. Um, orchestration. Uh, it also does very well with your deploying applications, your provisioning systems. So you're tying into your CI/CD pipelines. Um, I did this quite a bit. Maybe you're maybe you're there. Maybe you're trying to get there. Um, you know, picking tools that are not proprietary by nature that really restrict what you can do and what you can integrate with. Uh, Ansible is especially Tower is backed with a full set of APIs that allow you whatever you do within the environments today, I can have another tool do automatically. And really the, the end goal here, right? If Ansible is the next step, you know, the steps down the road is that Ansible is doing things without you really interfacing with it. Um, the security compliance, uh, this has been extremely popular, especially uh, over the last year or so, I would say, from what I've seen with Ansible. And that's uh, how you audit systems how you baseline, how you understand drift analysis between systems, um, how you get systems back to baseline, uh, how you uh, handle security threats, zero day vulnerabilities. Uh, I, my favorite story with this one is <clears throat> I remember being on a tack line call during Heartbleed and uh, as everybody, as everybody knows, you get a zero day come out, everybody gets on the line, we got to understand what the impact is, how we want to address it, you know, what are we going to prioritize as tackling first. And uh, my team was uh, one of the 10 teams that was on it. And we had actually, within the 30 minute call, had updated all our dev and test environments um, completely using Ansible. So that was actually a pretty fun uh, exercise that we got to do uh, and resolve things. And in all honesty, that was where we have to see a lot of organization adoption for Ansible just on that one event. You know, unfortunately, those are the high stress events, but at the same time, it had a great outcome. Um, what kind of devices can Ansible run across? I won't read these at the bottom, but regardless if you're talking a, uh, you know, a monolithic application that's legacy that's been around for a while, to physical servers, uh, to containerized applications and containers. Uh, again, the devices that may not have the same kind of operating system on them, uh, like network devices and storage, um, Ansible likely can work with. So pretty much we say if it has an ethernet cable, Ansible can get to it and do something. So automating on a platform is, is really the end goal. Um, we are, uh, you want to enable different roles within the organization to work with each other. You want them to work with, you know, on the same thing, but also be able to be efficient independently. Um, automation is key when you can reuse it. Uh, it's not, you know, having a one-off automation every time for every task isn't going to help anybody. So if you have a development team that's able to come up with one, some way of doing something that can be parameterized, and then hand it off to like a line of business or a security team to just modify those parameters and work for their case as well. That's really the best. And uh, so when we say that Ansible can increase communication across teams, that's usually what you start to see, right? Because you start thinking of automation in a way that it can be reused. And, uh, and how do you do that? And we'll, we'll go through some of that here. And I think it's exercise six. So keep these roles in mind as we go through these, uh, this presentation and hands-on activity. Uh, if you have questions about how different teams use it, or if you're a part of one of these teams uh, and you have ideas, more than happy to run through um, different use cases or um, you know, different ways of thinking about this if I haven't addressed it on the call. Again, the, the basis premise of a platform is that not only can you, can you create on it, but you can scale your automation um, out and up and then you can engage across teams. So uh, the component or kind of architecture diagram uh, in this sense for Ansible Automation Platform is really think of it in three layers. So if we start at the bottom at the create, uh, Ansible Engine is um, what is powered with this global innovation of the community. So at the speed of open source, which is what open source is really known for being extremely fast. Um, and kind of that famous line that the next big idea won't come from proprietary, you know, organizations that'll come from the open source community uh, is really key. And that's kind of what you're seeing a lot out there today. You're seeing a ton of interest in open source, you're seeing a lot of interest in uh, the tools and capabilities that come from that, that, that global innovation. 
Um, but Ansible Engine is what runs the things. It's what we'll be getting hands-on with first out of the CLI. Um, and then if you step up into the middle tier, you go into Tower. This is that tried and true enterprise grade operation uh, that provides the stability, the security and integration, uh, as well as a supported nature for what you would need to empower your system services and apps. Um, so think of Ansible Tower as, uh, you know, adding on top of what Ansible Engine has, because it does add other features and components that Ansible Engine doesn't provide you with, like centralized logging, a consistent UI that you'll see today, um, and uh, the ability to have APIs to tie it into those systems, like we mentioned on previous slide. And then at the top, you get this hosted services. So hosted services enable uh, your teams to leverage our efforts to help mitigate vulnerabilities, manage drift, uh, do policy enforcement, and even quantify your automation. Uh, we'll be showing this in exercise seven, um, and that in a sense is the stack. So if there's any questions about that, I'll pause for a moment. Okay. Um, technologies used today, uh, again, I had mentioned that we have a uh, uh, very robust ecosystem of partners. Uh, any technology you see on here, um, and then obviously the famous Billy Mays, but there's more. Um, we have a partnership with, they're likely contributing to the community as far as modules or plugins go for their technology. Um, so if, uh, you know, I, I could literally do this as a pick list for what I've used. I've definitely used it on AWS, uh, used it for OpenStack. I've done RHEL uh, and Windows with it. I've run it on top of VMware, um, put it across uh, any kind of F5 load balancers. Actually, Matt Brown knows that. Him and I worked on those quite a bit together. Uh, Juniper and Open Switch, Cisco, Checkpoint Firewalls, um, literally you named it and have also tied it into Jenkins or had Jenkins calling uh, Ansible scripts, so Ansible playbooks. So just if you kind of think of your architecture and you can name some of these companies off or some of these uh, partners that we have, uh, again, likely Ansible has the hook as well to be able to uh, integrate with that tech. Uh, this slide is usually something that our, our sales folks deliver. Um, while I, I like statistics, you know, I think being an engineer by nature, you always question them immediately, but that doesn't, you know, uh, take out the importance of what it's being said here. So uh, with Ansible, really think of your recovery time from a security incident standpoint being reduced. Think of the time savings you are going to get during deployments and truly over the life cycle of the system. And then uh, decrease in delivery times um, is actually uh, something that you'll realize very quickly. And then the lab environment that we have today. So if you access that link and got a workspace, uh, I think one of the best things that Red Hat does is we drink our own champagne. So uh, the lab environment today was provisioned, configured, and managed by Red Hat Ansible Automation Platform. Uh, we all use it. I use it for my home. Uh, we're using it for this lab. And uh, you're actually learning with the real thing. So while I, you know, you're not going to get a uh, like the ready baked turkeys that are in the oven, and we're going to have you season a, you know an uncooked turkey, then open the oven and there's a real turkey. Uh, you're gonna be doing the, the real thing. You're gonna be doing all the baking, getting hands on. So if you experience any hiccups along the way, please let me know and be more than happy to jump in live or off to the side. Um, so all the nodes that you have today, you're gonna have an Ansible control node. This is what's gonna be running Ansible Tower. You're gonna be managing three nodes. Um, if I say nodes, please think server, think endpoint of any kind that we discussed earlier. You know, kind of think of it as far as how it relates to your environment. Um, and we'll be going through some real life use cases that hopefully you can actually take back with you and, uh, and test out and kick the tires. So again, this is that life cycle of uh, how this lab was provisioned as far as resources go, the instances is given, and then the inventory it's being uh, run against. Um, it's is fully configured again from the tower installation to SSH and user accounts that you assigned to earlier. Um, the, uh, the any in browser text editors using like VS Code, for example, are all again set up, like, you know, start to finish with Ansible Tower or with uh, Ansible Automation. Um, so uh, I think the next thing is we'll go through the setup uh, before we get into exercise one. So the different components, this is a little bit better architecture diagram as far as the Ansible engine audit goes. So think of that three layers. This is that bottom layer kind of blown out a little bit. So 
uh, playbooks are probably the first thing. If you haven't heard of a playbook, um, a playbook is really what runs uh, Ansible. So playbooks can describe your system. They can serve as documentation for your systems. Um, and they're really the go between, you know, from your development to your operations, right? This is, uh, it's a, a very easy written instruction that's sequentially executed that uh, if you were to think of your written procedures today for anything that you're going to do from patching to retirement to, to stand up to user access, um, these playbooks are, are basically taking that written procedure and assigning it to something that Ansible is going to run with. Um, they should be treated like source code. So we always recommend a version control system. So if you're using something like that, uh, we highly recommend it. If you're not and you're thinking about it, now's a great time to start, you know, uh, to get hands on with it. We will look at GitHub during this lab, but really any version control system works. Um, I've done it from a desktop sitting in the floor of a basement to, you know, doing a full up uh, hosted so, uh, solution. Um, so again, really think of playbooks as a list of tasks that you're telling Ansible what you want it to do. It's probably the simplest way to put it. This is a playbook. So uh, when we say that Ansible is simple to understand, simple to read, if you've ever seen a bash script, which we'll also see again here in a second, um, it's a lot easier to comprehend what's happening here. And just to quickly talk through this, um, all playbooks are started with three dashes at the top. It just kind of tells Ansible this is a playbook that we're going to be running. And the play is denoted with this first field. And it's just, what's the name? You can tell what this playbook's doing. It's going to install and start Apache. So we're likely doing something with the web server. The host or the inventory I wanted to run it against, I'll explain that in a minute. But this one, I wanted to do it against all my web servers. And the become means I'm probably doing something that requires S elevated privileges. Um, so I'm going to set that to yes. Uh, a piece that I like is, you really want to default things to run not as an elevated privilege uh, user, not as root, right? Because you're just exposing uh, security vulnerabilities along the way that you really don't want to become exploited. Uh, so Ansible does not require root and it shouldn't be run as root if you don't need it to uh, or even elevated privileges for that matter. So the tasks, like we mentioned, these are the things that Ansible is going to execute sequentially. These are your, think of your written procedures you have today. Maybe you haven't saved on your desktop, written on a notepad. Uh, in Excel, published to a, you know, a SharePoint site. Um, start thinking of those steps as far as like how you would run something like this. For this one, it's, I want to make sure that the package is present and I'm going to use a module to install that package to the latest version. You know, I want to make sure that this known good index.html file is there because this is a, a web, uh, web server that it's present and it's pulled it from the approved source that I have. So this is literally copying a file from the source to a destination on one or many remote servers that are in that web group. And then that I want to make sure that the service is actually started and running. So in a nutshell, um, this is what a playbook looks like, whether it's a, a Windows operating system, Linux operating system, it's going to look the same way. It doesn't really matter. I mean, it does matter, but it's not going to look different. So. So if playbooks are the toolbox in this uh, analogy, then modules are going to be the tools. So uh, there's a full list of modules that you can get to from the browser. Uh, I can put this in the chat session if you want. If not, you can likely just Google uh, Ansible modules and uh, it will pull you to a page that looks like this. Um, this is a grouping of all the modules. So you can kind of get an idea whether you're working in a cloud environment, database environment, uh, you know, you're working with packaging, you want something to do with the systems. Maybe you uh, have a lot of Windows infrastructure. I'll jump on the Windows modules right now. And uh, you can see these modules that exist and I'll explain what they are again here in a second. But um, uh, the nice part about the documentation, uh, I love documentation. I'm known for my documentation and uh, there's a ton of documentation around every you know, corner of, uh, uh, of Ansible. So uh, if you were to jump into a module, you're not sure what it does and how to use it. Uh, you're actually able to, from the web, uh, be able to understand what it's doing. Chocolate is the package manager for Windows, uh, much like Yum is for Linux. Uh, I can see all the different parameters, any notes about it. And my favorite part, and probably all of our favorite parts, if you're using it, is you have examples. So I can literally copy and paste this into my playbook, run it against a sandbox server, and it'll install Git, make sure that that package is present using WinChocolate on a, a Windows box. I have. Um, so jump starting code is, is uh, really the, 
one of the nice added features to having an open source community. Uh, so getting back to what modules are, modules are our tools in the toolbox um, in the scenario at the bottom. This actually comes from the playbook we just reviewed. Template is the uh, is the module that we're calling. So what this template module is doing is it's saying, where's the source of that file that I want to take it from? It could be on my local box. It could be hosted in a uh, version control system. This could be something that comes out of CMDB. And I want you to send that exact file and copy it to all my destination, all my endpoints, and this destination path, for example. So that is modules. Um, the previous playbook we looked at, uh, the modules on this playbook were yum, template, and service. So if you want to see those, you can go to that, that modules URL, dive into that, uh, or if you have any questions, let me know. Um, Modules, uh, very robust, a lot of capabilities here. Again, think jumpstarting your code, things that you call within a playbook that get executed, that are provided by the community. And again, the community uh, is uh, extremely large. So it's, it's actually pretty cool. So any technology you have, again, from F5 load balancers to NetApp storage devices to whatever other appliances you have in between, um, there's likely a module out there. And if there's not, there's a really easy way to, uh, to command and, and write to that endpoint as well. Uh, an inventory. So an inventory uh, is extremely critical because it ultimately is what your is the target of your automation. Um, so we'll delve into this more later in detail, but generally an inventory uh, like we're seeing here is written in an INI format. INI simply means that you're going to have a list of servers with uh, groupings set by brackets. Um, and this group is telling me, like we said, web servers earlier, I have two web servers, one database server, uh, two switches, firewalls, and load balancer. This is a static file. Uh, the inventory can be static. Uh, it could also be dynamic. Maybe it comes from a Git repo. Maybe it comes from uh, info blocks. You know, maybe it's your AWS environment that you have. Um, but uh, just know that uh, in operational modes, a lot of times you have all of them. You'll have, uh, we'll have customers that are deploying with uh, static and dynamic inventories and you're just pointing Ansible to what inventory you wanna run against. And that's it. So what we can do now is go get started into uh, lab time. So if you were to go back to that link, this will be exercise one. So at the top of this URL, there's a thing called Ansible rel exercises. If you were to click that, I think it opens in a new tab automatically. Um, but uh, this is the page that hosts our exercises. They're all very self-explanatory. Uh, the best way to look at this is I'll give you about 10 minutes for the first exercise. If we don't get through all the exercises, the lab environment will stay up for a few days and uh, let me know if you need some extra time with things. But um, I will say, go, feel free to go ahead and move ahead of me as I'm talking. Um, if you were to open exercise one, I would open it in a new tab or else you have to kind of click back on the browser uh, and I just get comfortable having, I feel uncomfortable if I don't have a hundred tabs open on my browser apparently, so. Um, but in this first exercise, you're gonna explore your environment a little bit. Uh, this one's saying, you know, SSH over to your environment. Again, copy and paste commands where you can. Hopefully you've already done this piece. Obviously this is a default uh, IP address. So change that with the IP address you have. From the terminal, you'll type sudo i. You're trying to elevate privileges and uh, step through this. It's actually a pretty short one. Again, just making sure you're set up. Uh, any questions while that's running or anybody uh, need to see more in depth, at least how to do these uh, exercises so far for exercise one? All right, the clock has started. Please let me know if you have any questions.
Um, if you did get done with it, if you want to put in the chat that you're done, uh, that just kind of gives me the indication that uh, we're good to keep moving. All right, how's everybody doing with that one? Uh, any hangups getting SSH'd in or getting connected? All right, I will take silence as goodness. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and continue the presentation. Uh, again, if you have any issues connecting to anything, um, let me know and we can uh, most certainly come up with workarounds. Um, again, if you were to get assigned a space like I had done for student three, for example, um, uh, a couple of ways to get in SSH from the terminal. Uh, the tower one will be doing a little bit later. And then uh, if you wanted to use VS code from the uh, from the browser. I'll just talk this through real quick. I would I would just open this in a new tab. 
uh, enter your password to get into that instance. And then the best way to do it is there's a terminal tab at the top, terminal menu button at the top. Uh, if you were to click that and click new terminal, then you can see here's my student three at Ansible. Uh, there's actually a little like uptick arrow you can do just to make this larger. Okay. Um, if you didn't get an, uh, a workspace, there is a, uh, a link. Let me share this one real quick. Hang on a second. Uh, right here. So if you were to click that and then enter your, uh, it'll prompt you for a name and an email. It'll assign you one. Um, so we'll spend a little, I just want to make sure everybody has this set up this way. If you want to work this off hours, uh, fully aware, uh, that, you know, uh, other things go on and, and work calls continue to happen even during these sessions. So as long as I can make sure everybody's got something to work with, by all means, I'll keep this up for a day or two. You'll be able to continue to do these exercises if you want, or kind of kick the tires on things. So. Hey, Mark. Hello. Hello. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I'm juggling between uh, issue at work and um, the class. Yes, yeah, no I was issue. able to log in, but where, where are the exercises or what? Um... Great, thank you for asking. Yeah, no issue. <clears throat> so um, if you were the exercises, I'll just put this link out. Oh, address. I see, okay, I see. Okay. Uh, you may have to toggle back. For some reason, it kind of looks like the web page cut it off on me just a second ago, uh, yeah. but let me, let me do it this way. So this would be the, the link to the exercises. Um, when you get to the exercises, I would open it in a new tab and, and I tend to open things in new tabs. Um, but these are the six exercises we'll be going through today. Uh, the first one is exercise one. If you were to open that in a new tab, this will kind of just talk you through getting SSH in, you know, it's really just saying SSH into your environment enter pseudo I just to get elevated privileges, just making sure everything's set up for you correctly. It does happen sometimes where I'll have to assign you a new space, uh, type Ansible version, all that stuff. So uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with, with terminal, let me know. That's kind of the expectation, right? So I, d I definitely didn't want people to be experts with uh, command line here. So please don't feel like you need to be. Um, this is using that VS code. So I'm gonna bounce again a little bit. Um, but from your, from your workspace, like I got assigned user three, there was this link for VS code. I clicked that and entered the password. Okay. Uh, the password comes from this area right here. So you'll see the password is actually repeated three times, but it is the same password. And uh, you just copy and paste this so that the nature of this lab environment is copying and pasting wherever possible. Um, you know, don't make it harder on yourself. Um, so I would just copy this password. And then if I SSH in, it's going to prompt for a password. I'm just going to, you know, command V, control B, uh, right click, paste, um, all that good stuff. Uh, if the, the login, the assigning, getting assigned a workspace doesn't work for you, uh, if you just want to grab one of the later student IDs, by all means, go ahead and do that. If you're seeing the full list still. Uh, did that work for the exercises? As far uh, as? Uh, yeah, I found it, yeah. Um, yes, sir, okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would open a new tab. There, there's a link at the bottom that goes to next exercise. I'll be honest, it doesn't really work that great, uh, depending on the browser you're in. And then, uh, so I just close that tab when I'm done with that exercise and then I'll go to the next one, so. Excellent. Um, any other questions before we keep going? I'll probably pick up the pace a little bit. By all means, uh, if work is calling, just know this workspace will stay up for you. Um, if it, I'll try to keep an eye on it. If it goes down, just shoot me an email. Uh, it'll stay up at least through tomorrow. Um, if someone needs it longer, let me know and I'll, I'll do what I, I, I can. Kind of like Matt said, uh, you know, we're, we're here. Please reach out to us. So, all right, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and get started with ad hoc commands. Um, 
and inventories. So, uh, so understanding a basic inventory, I showed an inventory a little bit earlier. Uh, this is what an inventory looks like. So for this instance, I may have node one, two, three, I may have, uh, you know, Ansible and I may have an IP address. So the format of what an inventory has within it, uh, usually I would see fully qualified domain names here and IP addresses intermixed. But it just kind of depends on what your source of your inventory is. So I've worked with inventory sources that are Excel files saved on someone's desktop, again, to, uh, to sources or something like a, a tool that manages, you know, DNS or, uh, you know, asset inventories as well as my source. And I'll pull that in. Um, but this is what the inventory looks like. This is kind of how Ansible sees it in that sense. By default, um, Ansible gives you, a, when you install Ansible, it gives you a default installation location. Uh, but it is common practice to have multiple inventories, say your own inventory, specify where that path is to an inventory, uh, not necessarily using just what's defaulted there, but it does give you something to start with. Uh, inventories, if you think of your environment, um, maybe you think of your environment as app, web, database, and storage, and you have teams that manage those environments. Uh, maybe you have geographic locations like east, west, west north, and south. Um, Personally, I would do geographic locations and then dev test and prod, surprisingly. And that was just because of the way we were managing in a federated model that that worked. And maybe you have a blend of them. So I would have dev test prod, sandbox, all within uh, geo locations, you know, east, west, north, and south. Um, the, uh, you know, kind of, so this is just kind of walking up what a basic inventory and what you can do with it. Um, Within that inventory, you may have a mix or a blend of operating systems that are running on that or even accounts for how to get to those inventories. Uh, so you can have all those inventories all within one file or one source, or maybe you parse those sources out and have multiple inventories. Maybe you just have a web inventory like this one showing, and to get to those web systems, they're, let's say they're all uh, RHEL systems, so they can SSH use on port 22. Oops. Uh, and I have a, a username and password. This is not good practice, obviously, to have a plain text username and password in here. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing this operationally. You wouldn't do this, but this is just conceptually how you, you know, you can tell Ansible to connect to certain user accounts. You would not do it as a plain text, and it's not really designed that way either, uh, but you could. Um, the, uh, I can give host aliases. Maybe I don't want to remember IP addresses, which I always hated doing, even though I kind of knew too many of them. Um, and I want to actually give them an alias within that file. If you want more control over that static file, you can do that. Uh, same thing as if you're pulling from a dynamic source, you have the same kind of control. You're just going to uh, key it off of, uh, you know, keys or delimiters that you have within that. So what are the certain fields in there? When I pull that field in, I want it to be labeled web. Um, fully documented. Uh, it goes out onto this site, I believe, from dynamic inventories. If I can't find it, I will send it out shortly. Um, but again, I do love the uh, yep, developing dynamic inventories. Uh, I love Ansible's documentation. Again, community community written and also community edited at the same time. So you uh, can imagine that you're getting quite a bit of experience to, to provide this. Uh, your first ad hoc command. So we had mentioned modules earlier and uh, a lot of times, or we mentioned playbooks earlier, a lot of times you don't want to write a full up playbook to be able to execute something. A lot of times you're on a tack line call because there is a zero day vulnerability that got dropped on you. And I want to see all of the systems that are reachable that you know meet a certain criteria. I'm not going to go make major changes across all of them, but um, I want to run something real quick from the command line. Um, ad hoc commands, that's what those are. You can actually do quite a bit, you could make very uh, complex changes to systems. It's just not recommended because uh, you know you, you don't want to break everything. I have certainly done it where uh, my team and I have been working together and we had the, the oops, we just hit all systems uh, and we had to go unset all those systems. Um, so it's powerful and great, but also with power, you want to be cautious. So um, what this, this uh, line is doing, it's basically telling Ansible, Ansible's ad hoc command uh, is the Ansible keyword. Run it across all your host. The dash M signifies module, so it could be dash M or dash dash module, and then ping. And really what that one's gonna return, um, it's not just a simple ICMP ping, 
it's actually doing quite a bit. So one, it's telling me that uh, it can connect to host. Two, it's telling me that Ansible can learn facts about those hosts that we'll talk about. Uh, three, it's telling me that there is a Python interpreter on those on that host. So if they're Linux systems, it's going to be a Python interpreter, depending on the operating system. Maybe it doesn't have Python because it's you know uh, an appliance. Uh, in that sense, you, it wouldn't do this. Um, but we'll go into what facts Ansible learns about a system. And then it's telling me if the system is responsive or not. You know, can Ansible actually make a change on that system? So it's telling you more than just a simple ping. Um, this is telling you Ansible can get there and do all the things that we just mentioned. Uh, the green, uh, we'll get into the color coding here in a second for output. Uh, Bash scripts versus Ansible. Uh, I have team members that were exceptional with Bash. Uh, they were dark wizards of Bash, which was awesome, but at the same time, uh, very difficult and complex to understand. Uh, also has a, a different caveat in that they are not item potent. Item potent is a word you'll hear thrown around the community in the sense that Ansible will only make a change when the change is needed. If no change is needed, it's not going to make it unless you force it to. Uh, whereas Bash, uh, if you run it once and you continue to compound it and run it, it's going to continue to compound that result. Uh, so think of if you've ever run a software installer on your machine, right? Maybe you just had to download Zoom, right? And you were to continue to run that installer, uh, you're likely creating more problems for yourself because it's just appending and adding stuff. Or if you were to write text to a file, well, if that text already exists, Ansible sees it, doesn't write to it again, uh, unless you tell it to where a bash script doesn't have that intelligence unless you really do quite a bit of uh, interesting work there and, uh, and get it to do that. So um, also just the nature of how simple it is to understand is, is important. So now we have exercise two. Um, exercise two is the converting bash shell uh, commands to Ansible. And if you open that in a new tab, uh, I can kind of quickly walk you through this. Uh, if everybody's working at the same time, what I can do is just call out uh, key points to this. Again, you're more than welcome to work ahead of me, um, but I'll probably just do a couple of minutes for this one. So uh, this one's basically telling you to work with your inventory. Uh, this is the inventory that you see on your systems. Uh, again, very similar to what you probably saw on the slides as far as the variables for how to connect, telling Ansible how to connect the host uh, and the control node. Um, it's going to have you run commands to list hosts. So Ansible node one lists the host. It'll give you an output of what uh, that node one is listed in. Or if you want to list all your web servers, maybe you want to list all your web and Ansible servers. And this is just exploring your inventory for what host may live in there. Um, maybe you want to do something more like a wildcard as far as what exists. So if it's any system that has dev in the name, for example, or maybe you just want to list all the hosts that Ansible manages. Uh, those are commands that you can run from your terminal or from VS Code, and it should return something. Again, copy and paste. So if you see these, uh, well, I think I dropped off the A, but you can see the output that I'm seeing. I'm not sure how small this is on your end, but uh, hopefully you get the idea. Copy and paste as much as you can. The Ansible configuration file, this tells Ansible how to behave. So maybe you want Ansible to do certain things certain ways um, based on the, the environment you're targeting or the inventory you're targeting. The, most, the best takeaway from here is this inventory line. So uh, I'm telling Ansible my inventory file uh, is here. So maybe it's a plugin, maybe it's a script, but uh, for this one, it's a static list of servers and you're telling Ansible within this uh, directory, look here for it. Uh, the lab does have you cat, or at least look at your host. So the, again, to kind of see that full list, if I were to copy and paste that over into, uh, well, I guess if I get to my browser, copy and paste that over into my VS code, you'd, you'd see that full list. Ping host, it is gonna have you do an Ansible web at dash M ping. Um, that one may take a second to run, just depending on your bandwidth. Oh yeah, because this one has student. So obviously if you're copying and pasting, you may have to do a minor tweak there to uh, get student three uh, host listed. So there's the inventory. I just had to swap out the X with the number three. Um, 
getting help. So Ansible doc, this is giving you a full list of all the modules. So everything you saw in the browser, uh, if I were to type Ansible doc L, oops, that's doc dash L. If I were to type Ansible doc L, uh, this will pipe out thousands of modules that exist with full documentation from the command line. So if you're comfortable with the command line, uh, you can search for certain modules. Um, you could jump into those modules and, uh, you know, maybe you're looking for some Juniper, maybe you're looking for some Windows, uh, but all the documentation on the browser is from the command line as well. And then it does have you run an Ansible command module. So for plugins that don't exist, or maybe you just want to run something simple because you know the command by heart, uh, you can tell, run the command module and then uh, just put in whatever that, that uh, you know, script or uh, uh, command is that you know. So uh, this one's doing the ID command and the other one's basically looking for the system. The last step, it does have you do a, use the copy command. So this is saying uh, maybe I want all of my hosts that are managed by Ansible to have uh, managed by Ansible in the Etsy MOTD. Um, this way it's easy for my system administrators to understand like I shouldn't make a manual change on these because it's a managed host. That is actually a best practice kind of indicates, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a nice flag to have this, so you're not, not making manual, manual changes that could be unset by Ansible. Okay, uh, any questions there? All right, um, again, I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit, so uh, please don't feel like if we're going through this too fast, you won't have the documentation available to you and the labs available to you that will be available. So. Um, playbooks, this is a playbook. We looked at this one earlier. Uh, a playbook is the entire thing from the three dashes to uh, the bottom of the file. Sometimes you see three dots. Within a playbook, you'll have one or many tasks. A lot of times you'll see many tasks. Uh, this one will have three. The task is denoted underneath the task uh, marker, and then you'll have a dash with the name of what this task is gonna do. Uh, the name is nice because you actually see it from Ansible Tower as well, and you'll see it in the output that you're gonna run. Uh, to know what Ansible is doing as it progresses through. Modules we explained, for this one yum is a module, for this one template is the module, that Ansible dash doc space dash L listed all the modules that you have access to and you would implement them the same way. And then running a playbook, you'll get different colors. Those colors will be green uh, if no change is made. That's item potency for Ansible, it'll make a uh, if a change is made, it'll be kind of like in an orange color. And then if it failed, Ansible will stop. It will not continue to make changes against any host unless you code it to, to uh, bypass that. Um, and this way you can understand what was changed up till then or what, what stopped. Um, running a playbook is denoted with the, or is uh, instructed with the Ansible dash playbook instead of just the Ansible command like we did for, for ad hoc. And then the name of the playbook, the output will, tell you it's if you uh, want it to by default it will gather facts about the system or the systems that are within that inventory uh, it will ensure that the package is present like we saw that the file is copied over and that the service is either restarted or started and then it'll give you a recap as far as what it changed what it didn't change what it couldn't reach or what it was failed uh, what it failed on and that gets us to exercise three um, what seems to be working, I think, is explaining probably what's in these exercises to folks. So let me know if that doesn't work for you. If you just want me to keep moving or do something different, happy to adapt. Exercise three is the deploying applications to Linux host. Uh, I just opened it in a new tab and I'll just kind of give you some takeaways from this exercise. So uh, it does go through playbook basics. So start with three dashes, indentation is key. Um, that is something I will stress as you're making your own playbooks or as you're reviewing playbooks. Uh, the spaces really tell Ansible, you know, what is grouped together and, and how that those tasks are organized. So um, if there's questions on best practices, I'm more than happy to answer those on this call or on follow-ups. Um, Important concepts, again, host, that's your inventory that you want it to run against. Task we reviewed become as elevating privileges. This one's gonna have you go through making a directory, uh, this exercise. So you'll make a directory called Ansible files. 
and then you'll start your first playbook. So you can copy and paste all of this uh, into that file if you'd like. And uh, it does have you build on that playbook. So not only are you starting it with this information, but then you're giving it its first task. Again, that task is gonna be similar to what we just saw in the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, running the playbook. So once you have that playbook saved off, uh, it should tell you everything on how you need to do that. If you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, but then it'll have you run your Ansible playbook command. You can copy and paste a, what we call sanity check. And that's just basically Ansible playbook, the name of the playbook, and then dash, dash, syntax, dash, check. And it's going to make sure that your, your spacing and everything is good. If it errors, let me know, or uh, uh, feel free to reach out, even send an email off. Um, a lot of times you'll see best practices. This is put at the end of this, this command. And uh, this way you can just uptick and delete that last part instead of rewriting the whole command. Uh, as you run the playbook, and then as you test it out, right? So obviously you want to test out changes. Um, a lot of times you do that with Ansible, but in this case it's having us do it manually. Um, actually this one does have you run the command module to test and make sure that that HTTPD package was installed on those nodes. Uh, it has you add extra tasks to that playbook. So again, this is the same playbook you had in the steps leading up to the step four. And now you're going to actually enable and run the service. So using the service module, the name of the service, you want it to be enabled so it can start uh, on reboots. And then you want the state of that service to be started. You can actually have it turned into stop as well if you want to control uh, what services come up on, on boot. Um, it does have you rerun the playbook, and then what you'll see is it's obviously going to not reinstall a package for a second time. It'll say that that package already exists, and then it will uh, make sure that the service is started. Um, creating a web HTML document. This one's going to run through the local host. Uh, you're actually going to go through and, and copy an index file over. So it's going to use a copy module to source and then send it to the destination of all the servers within the group you're running it against. So again, applying it to multiple hosts, uh, this one does extend the group uh, in step six. And that should be it. So you'll rerun it again. And you'll see every time you rerun that same playbook, it's not compounding those changes. It's only making changes when necessary. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, jumping into variables. So in the last section, we had talked about ad hoc commands. We saw the result of the setup module um, that you can get facts from a system that Ansible connects to. Uh, those facts can in turn be used as variables and that variable allows your playbooks to uh, be more dynamic in the sense of how it's used or how it's executed. Um, so in this one you can see the same kind of playbook notation that's familiar with the three dashes, the name of the playbook, the host I want it to run against this time is my local host, that'd be like my laptop for example, and then the variables I want to set. Um, this just goes back into Ansible facts. Uh, again, facts are the host specific information that Ansible learns about that server. There's actually quite a bit. Um, all of them are very useful. I've done it to pull all the servers that meet a certain subnet criteria or a certain operating system version um, and use that to apply as a variable within the playbook. So uh, by default, again, those facts are discovered. If you don't want Ansible to do that, you can disable that by just setting uh, gather facts to false at the very top of the file. Um, a playbook, th this shows a playbook basically using a debug command or a debug module. So again, I have the three dashes. It's telling me output the facts within a playbook. I only want it to run one task in this one, and I just want to print out certain Ansible facts. The debug module allows you to print stuff out. So a lot of times you'll use this module as you're creating a playbook just to understand what things are being set or where they're at. So you don't have to do a test afterwards. And uh, then you'll like comment or delete this out usually. Um, 
but I wanted to print out a message that the default IP address of whatever host or in all, I wanted to print out the fully qualified domain name and the IP address. So uh, I could even send that to a file, for example, but this, I'm just printing it out in the command line. Um, so you can see node three, which is the FQDN that's entered for that one. Here's the IP node one, IP node two, IP. Uh, another common way to organize variables is actually in files. Um, so this one's actually will have variables set within files. Um, it'll put it within group variables or host variables. So think of like the group of all my web servers, I wanna have this variable. Or if I have a certain production host and node two is my production host, I wanna set this variable. The next slide is just showing if I were to look into those group vars web file or that host file node two for my production server, Oops, sorry. Um, then I'm setting a variable of stage to dev or stage to prod. So now when I run that, a copy module of web.html, I want to name or pull the source from my dev or my prod web HTML, maybe I have different files. And I just want it to be one playbook that I run that handles different hosts differently. Um, so again, think of environments, think of geos, think of something that differentiates uh, your inventory um, and how you want Ansible to behave uh, dynamically against that inventory. And then this would get us to lab four. Again, I did pick up the pace for the nature of time, um, but I also would like to uh, make sure that I'm kind of explaining what goes behind these exercises if you're interested in working them on your own time. So exercise four is retrieving information from automation. Uh, this one will go through just kind of the common syntax for a variable. Uh, looks like this, it's usually spaces around it. Um, goes into creating a variable, uh, the variable files. So just like you saw on the, the slides, it has you make directories for the host variable and the group variable. Again, you can just copy and paste this command into your terminal and then creating files. So this one will do a web, uh, I want you to make a web.yaml file under the group vars directory. And then I want you to make a node to YAML under the host vars directory. Uh, the files that you're putting in there, um, it's gonna have this content. Again, you can copy and paste. So this will tell you that this one's a production server and this one's a development server. It does have you create another playbook. So uh, once you get into the playbook, you start it again with three dashes. Again, you can copy this and paste it. Um, it has you enter the task name, which is copy this web HTML to the correct system. Basically, you're gonna use the copy module and then uh, it'll uh, copy and or it'll take the source from whatever the sources that you said above that meets that stage variable, whether it's dev or prod and apply it to the system appropriately. Does have you deploy the playbook. Uh, it doesn't have you do the sanity check on this one, but you can always do dash dash syntax check at the end. Um, you can even tell Ansible to do dry runs. So if you did like a dash C at the end of this command or a space dash C, uh, it'll dry run. It'll tell you what changes it would make before actually making them. And then testing the result, this one's having you curl and see uh, what it has on each of these hosts to make sure that it was set for development or production accordingly to its role. Step five has you go into Ansible Facts. Um, so this one's doing uh, the setup module against node one, and you actually get to see all of the facts that Ansible can learn about a system. So if I were to copy and paste that command over into my terminal, let me just clear this out so it's a little bit easier to read. Uh, Ansible node 1-m setup. Um, this may take a second to run, but again, you can see all of the facts that Ansible does learn about a system. And it's actually pretty uh, robust from mounts to CPU and, uh, and any other facts that, that it finds out about it. So if I were to scroll up after that command completes, you can see the number of cores that it has, if it's hyper-threaded or not, number of vCPUs. Um, this is going into the, the amount of memory it has, and this will be available um, or provisioned. You know, the machine type, whether what the architecture is, if it's x86 or not. Um, 
any of the networking information. So obviously IP information or how the interfaces are hooked up. So again, the best way to think about this or how you might use fax is in variables, or maybe you just wanna find all the systems within your inventory that meet a certain parameter. You can also manually set these as well and manually create ones that you have your own value for. So if I wanna set, you know, my environment in this host is, of this subnet is, uh, you know, dev, then I can do that as well. Uh, any questions there? Any questions on facts or uh, again, where this exercise is, is taking it? Okay. Um, I will continue to move forward again for the sake of time, but by no means feel pressured to that you can't do this. If you have questions, I'm more than happy to jump back and do something with folks on the phone. Uh, the next one has you get into tower. So um, we haven't really introduced tower. This kind of jumps right into a capability of tower from your lab environment. There is an Ansible Tower Access location. Uh, it gives you a link. If you open that link in a new tab, it'll ask you for the username, which will be admin, and then just copy and paste that password again. And uh, you should be able to access your tower environment that you have. This, this is pretty cool because um, I found tower extremely helpful for my team members that were strong with Ansible, um, could make playbooks and write playbooks as you know, we're talking through them. And then my team members that weren't as technical, uh, I could still have them run commands, um, run playbooks in that sense, and even set variables for those playbooks to run against using Tower. Uh, it has full role-based access control, uh, integrates with your active directories or whatever your authentication provider is. Um, and there's a ton of capabilities I could probably soak up another 90 minutes for. Um, but specific to this part of the presentation, it goes into surveys. So surveys allow you to configure how a job runs or, or actually a playbook will run um, within Tower itself. So uh, it's really easy to do validation, you know, input validation. Um, if you want to set certain parameters, if you want it to run against certain things or even set certain values. Uh, the stepping up a level you put a survey in a template. A template is uh, useful. Again, it's how you're running playbooks against your environment. So uh, what we'll do here shortly is you'll click on the templates section of your tower in installation. Uh, you'll either create a template or edit one that's existing, and then you'll actually add the survey. Um, so templates are using playbooks, which you see in the field here. Uh, playbooks are usually grouped within projects and surveys are uh, added to those templates to control how you're reusing or using that template. So really think of cross team. I have different team members doing different things and different skill levels. Um, pretty much think of any variable you can set, you could probably do using a survey. Uh, it's not com completely intelligent in the sense that it won't do what they call like the four eyes principle. I think it talks about that a little bit in the exercise. Um, but it does allow you to do uh, like basic commanding and controlling of how a playbook is executed. Um, when you're creating a survey, you can add prompts, you can add descriptions, you can add variable names and answer types for what you want to uh, user to enter. Maybe it's plain text, maybe it's uh, something different. So in the exercise, I actually have you create a banner that goes on servers. Uh, it's really helpful because I've actually put a banner on servers, for example, things like I want, uh, all these just to know that these servers are going to be going down, you know, at two o'clock today. Right. And uh, I put that on their login. So when they get to the server, people couldn't tell me like, oh, I didn't know that it was going down today. Uh, if they had logged in, obviously you, we coupled that with many other forms of communication, but just an idea of how we did it, a really simple one. Um, when launching that survey, this kind of just goes into that, that, uh, interface a little further when you're actually running against it. So this is the survey you'll be implementing in the exercise. I want you to type your own first line and second line, and then it applies that to the banner, those lines that you entered across all the servers in the, in the uh, environment. So exercise five, if you were to go over to the workshop is the self-service IT via surveys. I'm gonna open that in a new tab and uh, 
the surveys go or this uh, exercise goes through what you know really what templates are, how you configure them. It gives you the uh, location to the GitHub where things are stored at for this exercise. So if you want to look at the playbooks and how they're structured, you certainly can. Um, we take the open source strategy with pretty much everything we do, and uh, it has you make your first template. So again, template think I have a, a a project or a directory on my system somewhere in my version control system that has playbooks and those playbooks I want to be able to allow other users to run push button deploy from tower. Uh, that's template that's templates in a nutshell. If I want users to be able to set certain values that uh, that control how that or what that playbook is executing, I would add a survey to it. I don't want them to control anything and I, I want them just to go ping all the systems and see what servers are online and responsive. Uh, you know, maybe I, I wouldn't have a survey on that one. Uh, so this goes through launching the template and then uh, this actually has you check to see whatever field you entered into that uh, survey response. Um, you know, this is what is actually on the, the host itself. Okay. Uh, again, I will dive back over to the PowerPoint presentation unless there's any questions on surveys or, uh, or templates. Um, roles, this is the uh, best way to, for me to describe roles is that they are not uh, playbooks. Roles are ready-made content that allow you to really reuse your automation. So it's anything that your playbook may need. So kind of like you saw with modules, um, roles are made for modules, playbooks, plugins, and more. Uh, this is fully accessible from the web. It's very common for folks who start making playbooks to quickly go over to roles just so they can share it across teams. So uh, again, it's the resources like maybe I have certain static files that I want everybody to be able to apply to uh, their environments and set certain parameters this way it's specific to their needs. I would use a role for something like that. Um, there's a full community for it, and uh, uh, if you go out to Ansible Galaxy, if you've ever heard of that, um, I think we have links here shortly that go into that, but there's a full list on Ansible Galaxy. Also with uh, uh, Red Hat, we have certified content in our automation hub that goes through at least and shows you what kind of roles exist. Uh, again, really just think jumpstarting your automation when you think roles, not only jumpstarting, but sharing it across. Uh, teams and, and uh, roles and responsibilities. So this would be an example of a playbook, again, denoted with the three, oops, sorry, the three dashes and uh, the host that I wanted to run against, the task I wanted to execute. And this is a complex playbook that's actually just pulling in roles to, to execute. So it may only have two tasks, but I'm calling roles. Uh, this one's called Linux System Roles Firewall and Time Sync. The cool thing about Red Hat Enterprise Linux, specifically 8, is that a lot of the configuration is actually done with Ansible. So again, that drink our own champagne uh, mentality is even done with how we deploy and can control and configure uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So maybe you want to control firewall or time sync. Uh, maybe you want to set SE Linux parameters. Um, a lot of that can be pretty intimidating if you're not uh, you know, really trained in it. Uh, the roles actually make it pretty simple to set values that you wanted to apply to that system correctly. Um, uh, performance tuning is another way I've used those. So exercise six goes into system roles. Again, I'll just talk through this one. This is the last exercise shown in this uh, workshop. And within the system roles on this one, it will explain to you what those roles are. Um, it actually has one that's loaded uh, up for you to run. It's basically telling you you can go look at what goes behind this role um, from our GitHub. Um, but it does actually have you launch it from Tower. So from your Tower installation, uh, if you go to templates, you should see something in there called server hardening. If you hit launch, it'll have you uh, specify the host name or you know configure certain items it may have these values pre-populated for you which you can also do very uh kind of prompts you to do that when you're making a survey you hit next review those configurations and then launch it uh, the end of this exercise has you go out and check that host just to see what was set it's having you check the crony service on this one so what the time is set for this and uh uh 
I have actually done this as well because if you've ever tried to um, do any root cause analysis and your time is off between different systems or you're, you're sending and syncing systems together and your time is off even by the smallest fraction, that can be a real pain in the neck and even just break things miserably for you. So uh, I have sat there with a stopwatch on two systems and two different geos before, which is no fun. Um, but that, that uh, time sync role really works some magic, regardless of not only the different systems, but maybe different versions, of different platforms. So for this one, this time sync role works across RHEL, I think RHEL 6, 7, and 8. Definitely I know 7 and 8, and uh, there's different syntaxes for how to execute that, but it doesn't matter because the role is coded to handle any version. So uh, that was the last exercise that this uh, documentation goes into. Uh, there is one called exercise seven. It's not shown in here though. Uh, it does open the, the door to that third level of the stack that we were initially presented with on the components of Ansible automation. And this is insights. Um, what insights is, is with your, uh, with a Red Hat subscription, uh, specifically Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, or even Ansible automation, you'll get access to, um, well, this is specific to Red Hat Enterprise Linux. You'll get access to uh, remediations. So when you subscribe a RHEL system, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is uh, something that allows you not only to overview, review your entire inventory of systems that you have, you can apply policy rules. You can see what critical vulnerabilities exist. You can also see what remediations exist. And that's what Red Hat has provided as playbooks to resolve those remediations that you can download and run. So you can run those. Um, you know, and send it out through uh, Ansible Tower. You could pull it in locally, run it from your command line like you saw earlier. Um, but it is pretty neat. Again, just another way to jumpstart your kind of offensive strategy for automation against your environment. It gets really exhausting being defensive all the time. Um, if you're interested in seeing that, I believe I can pull up the, the link. Uh, it is from cloud.redhat.com. And if you have an account, go to cloud.redhead.com. You can log in and uh, you're able to not only see insights, um, but you can see this Ansible automation platform. This one goes into links that take you to uh, analytics around your automation. So if you want to quantify your automation and for example, you're reporting to management or upper leadership as far as like how much automation has saved you, there's some pretty cool analytics in here that we have taken from the industry and applied that are specific to your deployments and uh, registered systems. Automation Hub, if you want certified content, you know, I talked a lot about pulling modules from the community. Uh, if you have a security mind or if you, you've been down this road before, you know, maybe everything from the community is not worth trusting. And uh, you want stuff that's certified good, that has been scanned and tested by Red Hat engineers. Um, we do have certified content that uh, you can pull from and that we obviously recommend depending on your deployment. Um, but you know that's just depending on the the nature of your work, and then a services catalog as well. So uh, specific to that exercise seven, if I were to jump into insights, uh, and for my own systems, which I don't think I have many set here, if I were to click on remediations, um, it'll tell me, hey, you have these vulnerabilities. Download a playbook that will help you resolve that pat. You know, here's a patch playbook that'll help you resolve that vulnerability. Uh, vulnerabilities can be viewed from the vulnerabilities tab uh, on this insights dashboard as well. So um, you can sort it. If I had any uh, systems that were online, you could see that by sort of by severity, what when it was published, maybe what my exposure rate is or the business risk and the status of that CV. Uh, these slides explain that, gives you some links to go forth and uh, learn more if you're interested about it. Ansible Fest is coming up in October. It will be virtual, like a lot of what we're seeing around the industry. So uh, sign up for that if you haven't. Tons of great information at Ansible Fest. Uh, I always learn something and end up using quite a bit of it on my own systems. And that concludes the presentation for today. So I think that got us right to uh, the 90 minute mark. I can stay on if there's any questions or comments. Again, I can, I'm more than happy to jump as far back as anybody needs as well.
Usually you're going to leave, <coughs> leave this up for one or two days. Uh, yes, sir. <coughs> Absolutely. Yep, this will stay up. Um, so if you want me, I can keep it up through the weekend. Uh, pretty much, you know, you guys are in control. So let me know what, uh, what works for you and I can make sure I set the, uh, the date, uh, so it doesn't retire, but yeah, it'll definitely be up tonight. Definitely be up tomorrow. I can extend the date through the weekend if y'all would like. Um, so just let me know. Yeah. If you could do that through the weekend. Yes, sir. I can definitely do that. Okay. Um, I, again, I know the pace was fast on that one. It's because I blended slides with the workshop, uh, but I did want to, the slides do bring in some different points that I feel are important. Uh, just kind of works across the stack of levels that I've seen throughout these sessions. So um, if you want to learn more about something, please let me know. Uh, again, everything that we went over today is on that main site, uh, this site right here. And I'll put the link back in the window. This way it sends it to everybody. Uh, you can see the exercises, the workshop deck that we presented as a PDF, um, and uh, access any of the, the workbenches that you have. If anything gets stuck or hung up, please feel free to reach out to me <coughs> um, or the One Technology Group who set this up, and, uh, and we'll make sure that we get you working again. Excellent. Thank you all very much. Uh, any closing comments or questions? All right. I will go ahead and stop sharing and hand it back over to the One Tech group. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. All right, gang. Uh, well, thank you again for uh, sitting down with David and us and uh, going through this. Um, if there's any questions or comments outside of uh, what David just offered, you can go ahead and feel free to reach out to myself or Matt Brown. We'd be happy to help and answer any of those questions and work with you guys. Um, we appreciate your time once again, and we hope everyone has a great rest of their day and a great weekend coming up. Great. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you.